page. Sure is a heap of pigs all in one lump. Sure it is, Paul. Why, there must be, uh, there's one, there's one. That makes, uh... Well, you count them, Ethan. I'll start with that one there. One, three, three, three. Sure there's a heap of them, Paul. Jesus, ain't you learned to count yet? The Arkansas Traveler itself is this kind of multifaceted media extravaganza of the of the 19th century, and uh, it starts with a uh, a sort of legend or uh, even kind of a, a folk tale that was supposedly uh, told by a, a prominent Arkansan named Sanford Faulkner, uh, in which he tells the story about venturing into the the backwoods of Arkansas, probably somewhere in the Boston Mountains or in that vicinity, and encountering a, a squatter, a, a poor squatter at a log cabin somewhere who is uh, sawing away on his fiddle. Uh, the uh, the story then involves the kind of back and forth between this more urbane visitor, uh, who's assumed to be Faulkner or someone like him, and, and this uh, backwoodsman. But it becomes uh, a very popular thing. It's, it's uh, apparently performed throughout the region uh, and, and outside of the state. Uh, and it apparently inspired a fiddle tune uh, known as the Arkansas Traveler. And eventually it spawns uh, even uh, paintings, uh, which is probably the thing we're most familiar with uh, today, uh, the, uh, especially the, the first painting by Edward Payson Washburn, who was an Arkansas resident. It could almost stand in as the first hillbilly postcard uh, that that anybody ever did, and and eventually this, uh, you know, the Arkansas Traveler spawns a play, or actually a couple different plays. And uh, getting back to that dual image, what happens uh, with the Arkansas Traveler experience is that in most places in Arkansas, and I think in general throughout the 19th century, but even by the 20th century, most people in Arkansas who tell the Arkansas Traveler story and, and do the little comic routine, uh, keep the original version somewhat intact where the the squatter at least gives as good as he gets. And he's at least as wily and, and smart and, and maybe even smarter than the, than the city or urbane visitor there. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, the play that circulates around the nation, however, kind of turns the tables and the squatter becomes this real kind of backward hillbilly character who uh, is basically the butt of the joke and uh, and isn't the the person who's kind of tricking the the urbane visitor. And so, again, you get this, uh, you get basically the same scenario, but with two different interpretations of it. In most instances where this was recorded, uh, in Arkansas, at least into the middle of the 20th century, uh, it was Arkansas people were still insistent that the, the squatter be the, the protagonist of the story. And What's that? He might settle on Hank and wake him. He's lazy and a toad to hibernate. He ain't lazy. Just been laying so long, he's too tired to get up. Bobby, two of them. In the early 20th century, the Arkansas image undergoes this transformation or kind of more of a refining process whereby the, the image comes more and more to represent uh, a specific region. Then the Arkansas image, which had been in existence for generations, sort of slowly gets pigeonholed into that into that. Uh, national hillbilly image. And uh, an important aspect of that for the Ozarks is, is the publication of Shepherd of the Hills, Harold Bell Wright's novel that uh, came out in 1907. And uh, even though it is set in southwest Missouri, it kind of sets the stage for this dual image of the Ozarks, uh, where there are uh, these kind of uh, irredeemable backwoods hillbilly characters 
there's also this idea about uh, the backwoods Ozarks that this is some sort of uh, bucolic Arcadia, uh, that there's even something almost spiritual just in the, the hills and meadows and, and hollers and all that kind of stuff that, that gets one uh, somehow closer to nature. The Shepherd of the Hills becomes so influential for anybody who writes or does anything about the Ozarks after that point. Well, I always did want a hug stick of revenue. Snuffy sure ain't giving them revenue is no comfort. Recollect the time he put a hornet's nest in Cooper's car? There was a sting in him, and he was as speckled as a guinea. Uh, for, for a variety of reasons, the 1930s became the heyday of the hillbilly. You know, it was also an age when uh, a lot of uh, the intelligentsia were drifting toward socialism and kind of leftist causes and, and were championing the common person. And of course, the, the hillbilly was a... Uh, an icon that you could you could kind of embrace, and because Arkansas was so long associated with this, I guess you could say we were perfectly situated to to take advantage of of this heyday of the hillbilly. And so you have, of course, two of the the most popular comedy acts of the, or you might even say three of the most popular comedy acts of the of the 1930s, had Arkansas connections. You had uh, the, the Lum and Abner radio program, which starts in the early 1930s and, and actually continues into the 50s. Uh, two Arkansas guys from, uh, from MENA in the, in the Washita Mountains, and their uh, radio show is southern, uh, rural, uh, kind of self-deprecating humor uh, that becomes extremely popular, and Lum and Abner is still one of the most popular radio programs for old-time radio buffs today. Uh, in the 1930s and, and 40s, probably even more popular on the national stage was Bob Burns, who was from Van Buren, Arkansas. Uh, but Burns uh, burst on the scene in the mid-1930s, first as a sidekick for Bing Crosby on his popular radio show, and then Burns had his own radio show in the 1940s and, and made about a dozen movies in the, in the latter part of the 30s and early 40s. And Burns had this, uh, it, more than anybody from that era, he, he reflects that sort of dual image. You have a sort of dead period around World War II and the immediate post-war years into the 1950s where the hillbilly sort of disappears from view. Uh, it was almost as if, you know, the hillbilly character didn't fit into that era. Uh, but in the 1960s, and, uh, and largely associated with the, the folk movement and folk revival, you have a, a revival of the hillbilly character. And so you get uh, you get uh, the Beverly Hillbillies and, and Jed Clampett, and they're you know, just kind of latter-day versions of some of these earlier hillbilly characters who are, again, depending on how you interpret the show, uh, can be seen as either uh, very negatively stereotypical about people from... Uh, the mountains, or uh, or as I interpret the show, uh, it's more a social commentary on uh, the kind of vacuousness and materialism of upper middle class America. And I think that's what the creator Paul Henning meant the show to be was a a uh, kind of a satire of uh, you know the the wealthy and uh, the materialistic elements in America. And in that case, Jed Clampett becomes uh, the, the primary protagonist in that show. and He's kind of the, the authentic moral uh, foundation of the Beverly Hillbillies. And so, you know, it's, it's still that it continues that, that dual image theme. Mr. Carson... Yeah, sure, discombobulating. Coming here, chop licking, and they're taking my dream away. Just when I was going to shoot me that revenue. <laughs> 